Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Reporting Depth Be Heard on top of the roof of my condo, just about overlooking, can I say overlooking, the Washington Monument in the background uh, and the lovely sunset that you can see behind me. It's quite noisy up here, that's the only downside. I just started recording this after the jacuzzi had been switched off and now I'm having to compete with a siren, so... <laughs> You, you, you roll with whatever breaks you get, I guess. Anyway, this week's Reporting Debt Be Heard, or today's bonus edition of Reporting Debt Be Heard, comes to you courtesy of an interview with Professor Kurt Gray. He is Associate Professor of Neuroscience and Psychology at the University of North Carolina, and he specializes in how human beings make moral judgments. He's also taken quite an interest in the Debt V Heard case. So I was delighted to be put in contact with him, delighted he spared half an hour to talk to me, and I hope you enjoy the resultant interview. All I will say is that he seems to be keeping his cards very close to his chest. I'll be back at the end to say goodbye and to point you in the direction of what else is going on over the course of the rest of the week and when the trial will restart. I know some people are having withdrawal symptoms, so hopefully talking about it again on reporting Debt V Heard will help relieve that in some way. Kurt, thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, on a Reporting Debt Be Heard remote park bench interview. I was recommended, in fact, I was told I must speak to you by a mutual contact of ours. Uh, so I'd be very grateful if, first of all, you, you could tell people who are uh, uh, listening to this episode or watching this episode who you are, what you do, and, and what your interest is in the Debt V Heard trial at Virginia and Fairfax County Court. Yeah, great. Happy to talk uh, today. So. Um... I am an associate professor of psychology and neuroscience at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, and I study people's moral decisions, their moral judgments, how they make sense of the morality of a, a, of a complex and ambiguous world. So when you see someone who someone thinks is immoral, are they really immoral? How do you figure that out? Um, and obviously this trial is incredibly interesting to me because we've got two parties both of whom say the other party is incredibly evil, uh, it's divided many people uh, in America and even the world about who is evil and who isn't. And, and so that's obviously uh, why I find it so interesting because it, it's the perfect kind of demonstration applied example of my research. And is your interest in everything that is swirling around this trial? Because as you said, so many people are taking a view and taking a position in this trial, or is it the protagonists within the courtroom itself and the evidence that we're hearing? It's so I study the, the perception of morality, so how people make their moral judgments. And so I'm mostly interested in kind of everyday people's uh, judgments of what's going on in the courtroom. But but obviously, you know, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard are also people who are making judgments of, of the others uh, and their lawyers, right? Where, we're all kind of uh, united in some sense by the fact that we uh, see the moral world in a certain way and we are trying to convince others that our way of seeing the world is right and the other way of seeing it is wrong. That's the interesting thing about morality, right? Even if there's gray areas, it never seems that way. It seems like it's black and white. So when we dig down into this, I mean, one of the things that uh, many people are perhaps finding surprising is these, the... Um, the support that Johnny Depp has has taken on huge levels. It's it's over. It's it's taken over social media, and these are people who uh, come at this from many many different angles. You have people uh, within the men's rights movement who are saying that this is an opportunity to finally nail the lie that women can't be abusers. This is uh, women who've been abused and say, "I recognise patterns of abuse in the way that Amber Heard is presenting herself, or has mm. presented herself, or the evidence that the contemporaneous evidence that exists." And obviously, you have the fans who who believe their man man can do no wrong, and you've obviously got the pushback, which is coming from let's say the more traditionally feminist areas saying, well, this is J Johnny Depp. He's, he's showing the patterns of behavior of, a, of an abuser. And if there isn't any evidence, actual documentary evidence of him being abusive, or at least violently abusive, um, that doesn't mean that, that he isn't um, guilty of the, of the things that the Amber Heard is very graphically accusing him of. So how do you start to pick this apart from an intellectual and academic standpoint? Yeah, it's a great question. It's and it's so messy. And I think this is why it's such uh, an interesting case, intellectually speaking, right? Because when we think about abuse, we have a, an image that comes to mind. And it's usually, you know, the, the big 
drunken man who comes home and abuses his wife, right, who's much smaller than him, much meeker, uh, unable to fight back. And, and there, we kind of divide that moral situation in, in, into the kind of clear victimizer and the clear victim. And, and it turns out that that's our, that's our understanding of the moral world in general. If you think of any kind of moral uh, act, like, like murder, like abuse, theft, it, it doesn't matter. You always think of someone who's a pure victimizer and a pure victim. And many things fit that, but not all things. And so the reason that this case is, is so uh, impassioned on both sides is because that narrative kind of falls apart, right? Because it's not clear if, if, if Amber Heard is, is a pure victim or a little bit of victimizer, and it's not clear if Johnny Depp is just a pure victimizer or a little bit victim or, or, or reverse, right? It's complicated. And so anytime that there's gray areas in, uh, in the kind of pairing with an immoral deed, right? You're not clear who the victimizer and who the victim is. Well, people don't like gray areas in morality, right? We wanna draw a firm line in the sand. And so what has to happen is you have to pick one person, and I'm not saying you have to, but I'm saying that's how the mind kind of simplified these things. People pick, this is the victimizer, 100%. This is the victim, 100%, right? And so the fact that there's a little bit of wiggle room now means that one person's victim is the other person's victimizer. And then, right, there's no room for agreement. There's no room for agreement at all. Well, the, the interesting thing about that is that one doctor gave her assessment of their relationship as mutual abuse. And I picked that out as something um, that I thought was significant from that day's evidence. And the opprobrium that was rained down on me came from many people who said that mutual abuse is a discredited phrase. There is an abuser who may well accuse their victim of being equally abusive, but that's a form of gaslighting and that's a form mm -hmm. of muddying the waters. And so the, the idea that there is uh, absolutism in this, black and white in this, is, is kind of baked into the system, kind of baked into our value judgments and also baked into the law. I mean, the jury is being asked to pick a side, aren't they? That, 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 that is our way of resolving disputes in an adversarial system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a great point. And, and it's baked into those systems because it's baked into the way our mind works. Right, our, our mind works in, into, right? Like there's a reason that we have a field for criminology and then a whole separate field for victimology, right? And, and, and different scholars in each of those fields. Because when we study and we think about the world, we only think of, well, there's like criminals and there's the people they, they harm. And so I, I was gonna say, I like the fact that you got all this pushback about the phrase mutual abuse. And I, I don't like the fact that, that, that you got uh, rained on, but I think it really does illustrate how we split the world into these two camps. And the, the phrase that we, that we use in my, in my research is moral typecasting. So, and it's kind of, right, these are actors and, and actresses, right? And so they're often, like Johnny Depp is typecast as the kind of like silly Captain Jack, right? Uh, and it turns that we typecast people in morality as well. We see them as you have to be the villain or you have to be the victim. And it's hard to see them as any other way. So. The classic example of typecasting is Leonard Nimoy as Spock, right? It's hard to imagine Spock as the kind of fun-loving uncle, right, who likes to giggle. Uh, but of course, you know, if you know the, the man of Leonard Nimoy when he was alive, he, he was fun-loving. But when someone's in these roles, we can't see them as something else. And so we typecast, depending on your, on your political beliefs, right, your values, you either typecast heard as the kind of gaslighter who's who's pretending to cry on the stand or Depp as the as the gaslighter the villain who's like smirking during the testimony because he knows he's right oppressed amber and so right e each of these ways of, of defying the, are kind of like defying the idea of mutual abuse um happens on either side right because you have to support your narrative and destroy the other and, and, and that's the extraordinary thing about this case is that you have two diametrically opposed narratives, uh, which both sides are not just clinging to, but they're amplifying and amplifying with every day of court that goes by. Johnny Depp's is that he never laid a finger on Amber Heard. Amber Heard's is that he, he beat her up in, in some of the most horrendous ways possible over a sustained period of time. So where where do we go from here because they are in an adversarial court system they have people either side of them who are 
team debt team herd who are gunning for each other in 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 pretty horrendous ways online and and in um, mainstream media uh, as an academic who studied this what's what's the solution how do we start picking this apart how do we start to understand what may have gone on here in a way that is is more rational i mean i think it comes down to the assessment of well let's say there's there's two things that we need to understand when we consider kind of moral situation so one is is blame and the other is pain right and so we think of victimizers villains we blame them and we think of, of victims we think of pain right and, and and how our mind splits the world is we think that if you're blameworthy then you can't suffer at all and if you're suffering then you can't be blamed at all this is why in court cases the best way to escape blame is by emphasizing your own pain right because we see them as diametrically opposed and so i think what we need to do to kind of like begin to make sense of this complicated scenario is kind of run from this idea of moral typecasting a little bit even though it's baked into our minds we can understand that someone can be blameworthy and still have suffered and we can understand that someone who may have suffered real suffering can still be blameworthy but then one, once you kind of admit these things, well, then it's no longer black and white. And as you mentioned, right, the, the jury has to make a call one way or the other, right? Is it defamation? Is, is it justifiable? And so for, for, for those cases, uh, you know, I'm not in the courtroom, I'm not sitting in the jury, it's hard for me to know. But, but I, what I do know is that the, the sides that represent uh, uh, Depp and Heard uh, aren't as correct as they think they are. It's not 100%, right? We're really arguing maybe about, I don't want to say the numbers, but it's not 100% uh, or 0%, or right? And I think once we understand that ambiguity, we can be a little humbler when we're arguing, even if there's a kind of fact of the matter of what did happen uh, in their relationship. Do you have uh, a preferred model for this going forward? Because you're talking about this is, this is just the way our minds are set up. This is the way, is, th is this something that, Western society, for instance, has created this this kind of model of pain and blame or, or victim and, and oppressor. Are there other models that we should be looking at? Because as you say, it's so baked into our way of thinking and our morality and our, and our judicial system and the way that we, we, we operate, even sort of between the sexes. Is, is there an alternative or is that or we just got to work out ways to navigate it and understand it and then deal with it that way? I think there are, are probably some alternatives, and I think you're right that in, in the West, we emphasize kind of dualities more, right? That, that you have to be, you know, one or the other. You have to be, right, pick something, right? You have to pick a role. You have to, you know, pick a place in society. But, but I think it, it's kind of a human universal. So if you think of like the, you know, yin yang, the kind of duality between light and dark, right? That, that duality comes from, from, from Eastern thought. Um, and so, one way of escaping it is to say, look, we're we're all a little to blame, right? We're we're all guilty of, of having a toxic relationship, but at the end of the day, when you're fighting over, you know, what's defamation and and, and down the road, kind of like civil penalties, then I, I don't know if we can be, you know, fully uh, fully agnostic about it. I, I think that this idea of kind of like there's a person who harms and a person who receives the harm, it, it is baked in because that's just the way our language and, and our thoughts work. If I, you know, you think of language like, um, you know, she gave Spot the ball, right? You know, she is the one who's doing it and Spot is the one who's getting the ball. Why we always have, even in our simplest sentences, the kind of agent who's doing something and the, and the kind of recipient who's the, the target of the action. And so it's hard for our minds to escape this fundamental idea of like one person does something to another. Um, but I don't think it's impossible. Uh, and it's certainly when, you know, there's no reason to scream at the other side outside the courtroom for not believing with your preferred narrative. Does that, does that mean that we don't necessarily even have the language to parse the truth in a situation like this? Because, of course, you know, the legal system is forcing both sides apart in order to get a result on one side or another. And again, that goes back to the adversarial thing. But, but it sounds as if um, we don't even necessarily have the right language to talk about what goes on in intimate relationships, especially ones that turn toxic. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a great question about how much 
our, our language and our concepts structure our thought and ultimately structure our society. And I think, uh, I mean, I don't want to be too deterministic about our, our language, but it is powerful, right? It is powerful. And the way we, are, we understand the kind of moral world through our language and through the ideas that, that have been with us for thousands of years means that it's not easy to, to blame both people. It's not easy to see both people uh, as being victimized, as, as both people just, you know, being, being not great relationship partners. But the, I think one way of doing it is to kind of remove it from a moral framework if you can. So a moral framework always has the kind of oppressor and oppressed or victimizer and, and victim. But you can't imagine a kind of just two people not being very good friends to each other, right? You, you can imagine of two people in a relationship, just like both not being especially kind or especially thoughtful. And of course, when there's abuse involved, it's clearly moral. But if we can step back and say, well, they're both, they're both people who you probably wouldn't want to be in a relationship with, right? They're both not, not great partners. And maybe that gives you a kind of a little humility in thinking about the kind of complexity of the moral situation. So we could go into amoral violence, perhaps. <laughs> or at least amoral uh, relationship behavior, right? Maybe they're both bad at intimacy. Maybe they both had weird childhoods. Um, th there's, a, there's a saying, is, is to explain to condone. And it's often targeted at social psychologists, right? When we try to make sense of the atrocities of the world or the, the violence that people endure, and we try to think, well, let's think about why someone would be so evil, right? Let's think about why someone might want to cause, you know, uh, genocide in, in the largest case. And, and I'm certainly not an apologist for violence. And I don't think, you know, I, I think abuse is terrible, right? But there is something as being an academic, you try to like look at these problems and you try to think through them, right? Think of the mechanisms uh, of actually what's going on, almost like a, a jury in a courtroom, right? But ultimately my, what I'm trying to do isn't to figure who's, who's ultimately to blame, but to understand how people might be willing to do this or in the case of this trial, how we might see this uh, in, in such a black and white way. Okay, I'm gonna ask you three questions which might require you to make a moral judgment. Um, <laughs> I, or I think normally would require someone to make a moral judgment. I'm gonna see how close you get to making one or not. So first of all, what do you think of the torrent of online activity, which I think seeks to cancel out uh, opposing voices, or, 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 or there is there is the pick a side. If you're if you're not with us, you're against us, and we're going to do everything we can not just to um, disagree with you, but to make sure your opinion is cancelled out and raised up as an example of the wrong opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to say that uh, that online kind of social media is is a cesspool and not well designed for allowing people to express their voices in a way that is thoughtful and rational and that allows for civil discourse. Um, I mean, Twitter is, is a, you know, we, we all use, not we all use, a quarter percent or 25% uh, of people use Twitter, but, but, but the, the dynamics of it and the algorithm for it, right, are those that amplify outrage and, and condemnation. And so, I think the, the same factors in our mind that drive our one-sided perceptions of, uh, of deaf and heard also drive how we perceive others talking about these cases on Twitter, right? So if someone says, well, have you maybe considered this kind of, you know, more moderate perspective, right? Then someone comes down on that and then someone comes down on that and then you get this incredibly polarized echo chamber. So I'm willing to make a moral judgment on the fact that social media it is not great <laughs> for having a uh, reasonable discourse about complicated issues. It, it seems very easy to go from disagreeing to someone to ad hominem attacks on them for having an opinion. And that's, that's, it is what it is. And I don't know how healthy it is. Okay, second question then. Um, what do you think of the two forensic psychologists who gave evidence on behalf, as I'm asking you as a psychologist, uh, who gave evidence on behalf of each party because they, like the parties, were diametrically opposed and they, had exactly the same opinion as their paymasters of what was going on in that relationship psychologically. So, you know, do you, do you have your head in your hands for your profession sometimes when, when you can, what some people could say was go opinion shopping essentially for, for the diagnosis that you need to support your, your client's case? I'm not sure that my head is in my hands for, for psychology. I mean, 
I think there's also a difference between a consulting psychologist and a research psychologist. And this was right? a forensic uh, psychologist who studied without consulting. It was more just to, 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 to evaluate than anything else. That's right. I mean, so, you know, a research psychologist, uh, if I design a study, I, you know, ask thousands of people to rate their moral judgments. And when you rate, when you try to figure out the, the psychology of one individual person, there's much more ambiguity there, right? Psychology is, is a statistical science. Uh, and so you need a lot of people to figure out actually how the mind works. And, and I don't think that any one psychologist uh, can accurately kind of post hoc by talking to someone, especially when they're being compensated, right, to have a particular kind of view, can really make sense of, of what happened in someone's mind after the fact. Um, and, and we know, I think, I think more than kind of doubts about uh, about kind of clinical forensic psychology. I just uh, am, am more of a realist about human nature, right? If you're going to pay someone thousands and thousands of dollars to support your client in a kind of ambiguous situation, then they're going to find it easy to find evidence to support those claims. And again, because this case is and ambiguous. I was just going to say, right? they would, yeah, they, it is ambiguous, but they would push back about against this and say, no, we looked at the data, we looked at the science, we looked at our rigorous testing, and these are the conclusions we came to. Unfortunately, they happen to be diametrically opposed. And it made, made me think, you know, there, but for the grace of God, go I. What, what happens if I get assessed by one person who finds that, uh, you know, I might be an all right sort of person. And then the next person decides I'm evil and needs uh, needs sort of treatment because I've got something horribly wrong with my mind. You think, well, hang on a minute. Should should we be having this level of disagreement over the same individual? And, and again, I don't think I don't think that 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 psychologists are or anyone is well qualified enough to talk about the kind of inner morality of any one particular person in a court case like this. Um, I mean, we, you know, the, the classic example uh, uh, of someone on trial for evil deeds is kind of Eichmann in Jerusalem, right? Here's someone who did all these terrible things. And, and no doubt that, you know, that was a case where it was objectively terrible, right? He was the kind of architect of the Holocaust. But even then people, people wonder, was he just following orders, right? What's he really doing? Is he an evil person in his heart? And people still agree, you know, disagree about his kind of like inner moral character. And I don't think any psychologist can look at the inner moral character of two celebrities who are, you know, who's kind of, uh, uh, kind of abuse with each other and kind of assaults with each other has, has exploded out into this huge worldwide debate are well qualified to talk about like who, who is the true villain, especially when there's evidence uh, on both sides. And again, I'm not sure what, what evidence the side is, is, you know, is more on, but I'm not sure that I, I would trust these psychologists to, to be a character witness for you or for me or for, for anybody. And so final question, I, mean, you, I don't know how much of this you have been watching, but do you have an inkling uh, as to who is in the right in this case? Is it Johnny Depp or is it Amber Heard? Which, which version of reality do you prefer? So I, I've been thinking about this a lot. I've been writing a book kind of on, on how we understand victims and victimizers. And I think you, you can think about, about the kind of structure of victimizers and victims in two ways. One is the kind of general abstract way, which is that statistically speaking, men are, are more likely to victimize women. Men are generally bigger, right? Uh, more physically powerful, more prone to violence, men are twice as more likely to victimize women than vice versa. So I, I think I, I understand the kind of believe all women in that sense, because like in general, that's the case, right? And men frequently de de denied the abuse they were visiting upon uh, women. On the other hand, that's the abstract level. On the other hand, there's a specific level of actually what happened in this relationship. And, and I feel comfortable in saying probably, like a, you know, hedge it like a scientist, that, that whatever's happening in this relationship is not as clear cut as what typically happens in an abusive relationship where, where the man is clearly the, the only person who's to blame for the and, the, and the woman is the only person who is enduring suffering. I think this, this circumstance is muddier. And now, what makes you say that? Well, I think what makes me say that it, <laughs> I mean, just like anybody else, like I'm watching this trial, right? I, I, I'm not sure. Well, I, and I guess we need to see um, Johnny Depp's lawyers do the, the cross-examination uh, uh, of Ms. Heard, right? But 
But if I'm to believe some of the internet things, and I'm not sure that's justified, we need to wait and see this cross-examination, right? But if it also seems that, that, that Ms. Hurd has done some terrible things to Mr. Depp as well, right? Then it seems like it's not the, the and the fact, maybe, maybe I was gonna say that, that Mr. Depp is a kind of like a, a, a psychopath, but the fact that he thinks that there's enough evidence and his you know, lawyers think there's enough evidence to bring this trial uh, to court Right to even have a go at the millions of dollars in scrutiny that 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 Johnny Depp will be under suggests that there's probably some evidence there. Right, that that at least Johnny Depp um, is not 100% uh, pure victimizer. Right, but but let's say let's say that he ends up being 99% victimizer and, and and Amber is 1% victimizer. That's still not 100% 0%. But does that relative difference? make Johnny Depp an actual victim, or is he still the victimizer? I think this is the, the difficult thing that you hinted at, right? Because these judgments are absolute judgments, right? We have to make, the jury has to make a judgment, yes or no. But really what we're dealing with here is a, is a relative difference. Depp is likely less of a victimizer than your kind of classic storybook victimizer, but does that make him not a victimizer? Does it make Amber Heard a victimizer? I don't know. <laughs> Neither do I. And thank you very much indeed for your time, Professor Gray. It's been fascinating to hear it from a, from an academic perspective. I'm I'm collecting various different opinions on this, and this this is this is a really really valuable one. So thank you very much for your time. Great. Thanks for having me. My thanks to Professor Kurt Gray for that fascinating interview. Still not entirely sure where he's coming from uh, in terms of whose side he's on when it comes to the. Uh, Depp v. Heard court case, but it was great to get his sense that uh, it's a little bit relative, I think is probably fair as a summary. If you want to subscribe and support my work, then please do so. You have to press subscribe, I think, or the YouTube thing. And also, if you want to financially support my work, you can go to reportingdeppvheard.net slash newsletter. That's reportingdeppvheard.net slash newsletter. And uh, you'll be able to sign up to the regular newsletters that I send out. Uh, they're more sporadic when court isn't sitting, but they do come out on a daily basis reporting on what happened in court when there has been a session in court. And the next one will be on Monday the 16th of May. We're starting at 9 o'clock, going through to potentially 5.30. Four days next week, then five days in the final week. And then sometime in early June, we expect to find or hear a verdict. So that's the way that the court thing is going to run over the course of the next two weeks. I'm going to try and do one or two more bonus interviews, which uh, may help you um, listen to other people, contextualise what they're thinking about things and whatever angle they're taking on it, whatever position they're coming from. It's always good to get a different opinion. I'm certainly learning a lot over the course of this lengthy and gruelling trial. But I hope you're enjoying the week off and you're getting some sleep if you have been <laughs> attending court and uh, not suffering too many withdrawal symptoms if you've been watching on the Gogglebox. I will be back soon, I promise. Take care.